You mentioned that you're not a mainstream psychoanalyst in the sense that you've actually taken in the developments of neuroscience since Freud's death. But one of the most fascinating elements of the hidden spring, I mean, before we get into consciousness, for me was that you think of Freud as a neuroscientist, which I don't think is in the zeitgeist anymore. And dispelling this or perhaps explaining in just what sense you mean this should do a lot to dispel people's misconceptions about Freud as a, like a total mystic who wasn't doing science. Well, um, I, I told you that when I was doing my dream research, I became uh, aware of um, the extent to which Freud had um, made some claims about it, which were consistent with the, what I was finding in, in my research. Uh, the, the, I became aware of that uh, through a seminar that was taught, in fact, by a philosopher, um, but it was a seminar on a unpublished or unpublished during Freud's lifetime. Um, uh, uh, he was doing a seminar on an unpublished paper uh, or manuscript uh, that was entitled "A Project for a Scientific Psychology," which was Freud's attempt, penned in 1895, uh, to um, to delineate what the uh, neurophysiological mechanisms might be of the sorts of things he was observing clinically. When I say the sorts of things he was observing clinically, I mean what he was observing clinically as a neurologist studying what we nowadays call functional neurological disorders. Um, the word functional neurological disorders uh, covers, um, centrally covers what in Freud's day was called hysteria. Patients uh, with so-called hysteria present to neurologists uh, because they have what appear to be neurological symptoms: paralysis, um, amnesias, um, you know, a, a loss of the ability to speak, and so on. So they look like neurological patients, but then it turns out there's there's no structural uh, damage to their brains. So that's why they're called functional neurological disorders. So Freud, as a neurologist, uh, became interested in these patients, which, by the way, I mean, I work in a neurology department. Uh, we see them every week. I mean, they, this is not an uncommon condition. Um, so it's, it's no surprise, uh, and it's fascinating. It's no surprise that Freud you know, was working with those sorts of patients. But the point I'm emphasizing is that he was a neurologist. Um, and uh, he was a neurologist after... Uh, he was a research neuroscientist. Uh, he 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 went to medical school really with scientific interests rather than clinical ones, uh, and he did some extremely um, good research on what uh, what what is probably best called neurohistology. In other words, the structure of the nerve cell. Then he did very good basic neuroanatomical research, <clears throat> starting with very lowly invertebrate creatures and 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 low vertebrates uh, primitive fishes um, like um, uh, the lamprey uh, studying their spinal cords uh, and the uh, and the intimate structure of the spinal cord gradually moving up toward the brain stem and with that gradually moving uh, to human brains um, until uh, he uh, he he realized he wasn't um, going to be able to make a living he wanted to get married. He wasn't going to be able to make a living as a neuroanatomist, and so he went. Uh, uh, he, he took more seriously the clinical part of his studies, and uh, then qualified as a neurologist and made fundamental contributions to the study of um, cerebral palsies, you know, the, uh, um, the movement disorders of childhood, um, and ultimately moved up. Uh, the, to the higher cortical functions and, and did a, a very good study on aphasia um, in 1891. So given that background, you know, the background of a histologist, an anatomist, a, 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 a clinical neurologist making you know, a s substantial contributions to the field and ultimately a neuropsychologist uh, when he studied uh, um, uh, language, brain mechanisms of language, it wasn't surprising that he wanted to um, he wanted to 
understand so-called hysteria um, in in neurophysiological terms. And that's why he wrote that project, which is the first of his papers that I read. Um, now, uh, ironically, uh, the reason that Freud abandoned uh, neurophysiological approaches uh, was because in his attempt to delineate the brain mechanisms of functional neurological disorders, he had to recognize that it was pure speculation. Uh, in 1895, we just didn't know enough, or we knew practically nothing uh, about the dynamics of the brain, uh, in, in the function, uh, the functional organization of the brain uh, when there's no structural lesion. We just knew next to nothing about it. So he was wildly speculating in that 1895 paper and was then compelled to recognize a against uh, his, his own uh, uh, prejudices uh, he was compelled to recognize that the, and this is why I say it's ironical, that if you want to have an empirical approach to the problem, you should stick to psychological data because that's the only data that we had. Um, and so he abandoned uh, reluctantly uh, his attempts to um, to understand these things neurologically, but always said from then onwards um, that one day, uh, they will, when there are advances in methods, um, that uh, we, it will be possible to to study the apparatus of the mind, as he called it, um, you know, f from a physiological and anatomical point of view. And so I recognized that that uh, th that future that he was looking forward to, that I was living in that future, um, you know. So so uh, uh, that's why I I made it my business to to try to rejoin psychoanalysis with the neurosciences, uh, which is what Freud had always imagined uh, would be possible. I'll tell you one other thing. Uh, I am actually in the middle now uh, of uh, translating all of Freud's neuroscientific writings into English. It's going to come out as a four-volume set because there are a lot uh, of uh, neuroscientific. Freud published from 1877 until 1900 uh, in neuroscience and, and neurology journals. And if you count uh, the small review articles, uh, there are over 200 titles. So, you know, Freud was very deeply steeped in the neuroscience uh, uh, and neurology of his time. And uh, when one of his psychoanalytic um, colleagues uh, in 1936, um, the guy's name was Rudolf Brun, who was also a neurologist, uh, d became aware that Freud had produced so much uh, neuroscientific research in his early years uh, he, he said to Freud, you know, why, why, why don't you ever talk about this? This is fantastic stuff. And Freud said, well, at least I hope it will make people realize that I didn't pull psychoanalysis out of my hat. <laughs> uh, it, parenthetically, is that what you're doing? In, I, you mentioned that you're on your sabbatical in Germany. Is, that, is it mainly to be working on these translations? That's exactly what I'm doing here, yes. Oh, very nice. And then, yeah, I guess just to paraphrase again and make sure that I'm totally on the right page. But what struck me when I was reading The Hidden Spring again was that this is the paraphrase part. He totally, Freud totally believed that the mind was biological, mediated in the brain. So again, nothing mystical but that really just due to the limits of neuroscience at the time, he sought another method to get at the underlying unconscious dimensions of the mind and that this is what psychoanalysis emerged from. But as you just said, he suspected or expected that at some point science would develop to the point where these things would merge again. And that is what you're working on now. Yeah. Um, he... Um, he, when you speak of the unconscious dimensions of the mind, I would like to just elaborate a little bit on that point. Uh, Freud said uh, that, uh, that what he was interested in doing uh, is inferring from the conscious phenomenology of mental life. He wanted to infer uh, what the mechanisms were that underpinned those uh, uh, conscious states. He called that meta-psychology. In other words, beyond psychology in the sense of beyond consciousness, what lies beyond consciousness. And he said 
since you're a philosopher, you might find it amusing. He said, I want to transform metaphysics into metapsychology. In other words, he wants to have, a, rather than a philosophy of mind, you know, he wants to have a science of mind uh, where uh, we infer the underlying uh, uh, laws governing uh, the observable surface of, of conscious phenomena. And um, the point I'm leading up to is this, that what Freud called metapsychology uh, was an attempt to describe the underlying functional organization of these abstract entities uh, like memory systems, perceptual systems, executive systems, and so on. Uh, it, it, in other words, the very same things as we are interested in uh, in cognitive neuroscience today. You know, there's a it, we don't study the brain as a as a thing. Uh, you know, as a as a as a visual tangible thing. We study its functions in order to be able to infer its functional organization. That is the common ground between uh, neuroscience and psychoanalysis. This the functional organization of of what Freud called the mental apparatus. Um, and uh, I think that um, if we only approach it from an external point of view, in other words, if we treat the brain only as an object and not also as a subject, then we are going to miss something fundamental about this part of nature. Because uh, as far as we know, it is the only part of nature that has subjective experience. Uh, presumably there's some reason why it feels like something to be a brain and not like anything else. Uh, in other words, nothing else feels like being itself. It's only brains that have this uh, this remarkable capacity. And uh, presumably it evolved for a reason. Presumably subjective experience does something. And uh, if we leave that out of account, I think we're going to uh, be grossly misled in terms of our understanding of the functional organization of the brain. Um, if we don't build into our understanding of its mechanisms, what can be learned about those mechanisms from the subjective point of view? Uh, in other words, what can be learned about wh what the subjective manifestations are all about? Uh, th then I think um, we'll never understand the brain if we treat it as if we're the same as the liver. No, that's a that's an extremely interesting point. I mean, we're not just trying to dissect brains and figure out their ultimate makeup because that would just, I mean, ultimately devolve into something like physics, but we're trying to understand what it does. And that's all about inference. It's all about connecting what we observe in the brain to I think what you said, what it what it does. And that comes from something like psychoanalysis where you're really getting at the subject and what 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 feeling is going on well, what is in consciousness yeah let me let me be clearer than i think i was I, I i'm actually saying two things there the one is that we're not just interested in observing the organ we're wanting to infer its underlying functional organization that's the first thing but the second thing i'm saying is that that underlying functional organization must also explain uh, why the brain has a subjective aspect you know why does the brain, why is there something it's like to be a brain and not something it's like to be anything else? I'm saying there must be something fundamental about the brain uh, that, that, that makes it sentient. And uh, so I'm saying I don't think we will understand the mechanisms governing the behavior of the brain if we don't centrally uh, include in our attempts to understand those mechanisms uh, why those mechanisms give rise to experience. 